Hello everybody, this is Gregory with 5-Minute Catholic Apologetics and Living, where 5 minutes of your time may get you to the divine. Today we're going to talk about a letter that came out from the Vatican called the Bishop of Rome and how it is another attempt at, I would say, at the, at the, at the, at the nicest, poor ecumenism, at the best, bad ecumenism and wrong ecumenism and false ecumenism. Now before we begin, let's start with a prayer. Nomina Patris et Filio et Spiritui Sancti. Amen. Gloria Patri et Filio et Spiritui Sancto. Sucutura Principio et Nuc et Semper. Es seculi, seculor. Amen. So back in June of this summer, 2024, there was a document that was released called The Bishop of Rome, Primacy and Synodality in the Ecumenical Dialogues and in the Responses to the Encyclical Ut Unum Sint. And this was released by the Dicastery for Promoting Christian Unity. I mean, right there, the Dicastery of Promoting Christian Unity, just, just kind of, it's like fingers on the chalkboard were right there. But this document, it was a study document, is released in the 30th anniversary of Ut Unum Sint, which was written by St. John Paul II. Look, like, what's, what's my issue with the Bishop of Rome? And I'll put a link in this. Not, not that I have an issue with the Bishop, well, I don't know, do I have an issue with... <laughs> Pope Francis, I'm talking about the document, the Bishop of Rome. Uh, what, what, I, what I have a problem with, and I'll put a link in the episode notes so you can read it. It's not that long at all, but I thought it'd be very dull for me to read the major points from it, is it's, it's in this path of bad ecumenism that we've seen since Vatican II. See, prior to Vatican II, ecumenism was, we are the church founded by Jesus Christ. We have the fullness of faith. We have the entire Bible. We have all the sacraments and, you know, fill in the blank, whatnot. You need to come back to us, separated brethren. Back then, you know, prior to 62, we wouldn't call them separated brethren, but you need to come back to us. That was ecumenism. And then we've had false ecumenism the last 50 years. Well, well, you know, you know, the indifferentism spoke analogy. There's a lot of different spokes on the wheel and they all lead to the same thing, this indifferentism. Like, yeah, it doesn't really matter what you belong to, you know. I guess, I guess we're kind of the, the real church founded by, by Christ, but uh, yeah, you know, if, you, if the Pope wants to kiss the Quran, I guess that's okay. And so this, this ecumenism we've had in the last 50, 60 years is this attempt to appease, assuage Protestants and Orthodox, and really anybody, again. The most, uh, I guess, hyperbolic or egregious example would be when John Paul II went to the Assisi Conference and invited all these people from not just different Christian religions, but he invited Buddhists and Muslims and whatnot. And even there's the famous scene of him kissing the Quran. And it's not like Benedict was spared of this. Benedict was also going to these events as well. And I think it's been misguided, just like this, this letter. And even this letter, if you read it, it says that the, the primacy of Rome can be a divisive factor and can be an impediment to other Christian groups. I, certainly, it, it can be an impediment if you don't agree with the primacy of Rome, but I think the, the mindset is wrong. The mindset that we've done the last several decades is, well, you know, we are the, the, the true church, but we need to really hide it in the, in the sake of bringing, pe bringing people in. And has it been effective? No, it has not been effective. Ecumenism since the 1960s has not been effective. Changing the mass, this is one of the reasons that the Mass was changed back in 1970, was to, in fact, appease and appeal more to the Protestants. Um, you look, it was almost, it, 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 it's almost like a replica of Archbishop Kramer from the Anglican Church back in the 1550s, his version of, of their Mass at the time. And if you look at the kind of architects of the Novus Ordo Mass, they were open and when they said it, it was just like a way to bring in more Protestants. And so you've kind of seen like a lot of the things that we've done in the last few decades have been ways to think, you know, I, I think on some level it was good-hearted, well-intentioned people. I'm certain there's some change agents in there who, who knew that would be watering down the faith. But I think like a lot of well-intentioned liturgists at your parish that have really bad music or whatnot, I think it was well-intentioned, but it led to bad fruits. And so the, the, the false ecumenism of... We are not the true church, you need to come to us, but we're just like one of many spokes and we don't want to offend anybody by saying that we are the true church. 
has been disastrous. It hasn't worked. And it's so unmasculine. It's so impotent. It doesn't like appeal to anybody at all. The enemies of the faith, and of course the faith has enemies, they love it, right? We're watering down our faith, and we, we kind of try to appeal to them. It's, it's like, what, like the young kids would use the word thirsty. When, when a celebrity or somebody is so thirsty, they're thirsty for attention. They're people pleasers, right? They're lap dogs and doormats. It's almost like the 2,000-year-old the church, the, ch- the longest institution of human history, we've become thirsty the last 30, 30 30, 40, 50 years. Like, oh, please, please join us. You know, we'll water down everything that we believe just to appeal to you guys. And then those groups don't come in because we appeal to them. If you look at converts that come from, especially the Protestants, where do they go? They go to the traditional parishes or they eventually end up at the traditional parishes because the traditional side of the faith still represents and stands for something. Whereas if you see every attempt you make to accommodate and to appease, you just don't look very attractive. And you can see this really borne out in the mainline Protestant faiths uh, since the 1950s. You look at the Anglicans, the Presbyterians, the Methodists, where they have changed their doctrines on faith and morals. Just think of female priests or open homosexual clergy and whatnot, and nobody goes to them. Those numbers of boop. So we see this played out, that people will go where there's still a bastion of truth. In the Catholic Church, is the church founded by Jesus Christ. And we need to be proud of it and proclaim it. It's like, this is true. You need to come to us. And if you don't, you know, that's on you. Instead of like, we're just one of many spokes. Christian unity. No, there's no, there's no Christian unity. Christ said that the church may be one. He said that in the Last Supper. 1 Corinthians 1 talks about the church must be one. There's one holy catholic apostolic the four marks of the church there's one church we are the true church and anytime you kind of have this this synod synodal collegial perspective where you know and some of the orthodox are, are, are separated brethren here will say that really the church needs to be just a collection of independent communities where you know we give lip service to the bishop of rome but really he has no jurisdiction over us we're just all going to be autocephalid or autonomous communities. How is that borne out? Anytime you have a leaderless group, a rudderless group, it just leads to chaos. And you see that in the Orthodox, where even within their autocephalic churches, the Bulgarian church, the Russian church, Ukrainian church, they can't even get along with each other. They can't even get along with each other. Because once you leave truth in one entity, the way it was intended, Christ gave the keys to Peter. Once you leave that, in every example, not just religious, but anywhere, anywhere we think people think, well, we can just have this loose conglomeration of entities. You can see this with ancient Greece. You can see this anywhere. It always leads to chaos, disunity, and infighting. So in closing, true ecumenism. Guys, you know, like in, in Rome, just stop with this. Even the name of the dicastery of Christian unity should be really the dicastery for we are the one true church come to us. I know that's a long title. But it should really be that we just need to reorient our focus and just stop with this nonsense false ecumenism because it doesn't serve anybody well, including Catholics, but certainly Protestants and non-Christians. Guys, post in the comments. I'd love to hear from you. Until next time, take care. God bless. Amen.